This is the multi-voice text-to-speech podfic reading of Move to Begin by Synonymy, composed by Burning Aurora and Kailana. Selene, Sirius said. Goddess of the moon, right? Remus looked at him, surprised. Where did you hear that? Sirius didn't stop smiling down at the bundle in his arms. It was in one of your books. When did you? You left it on the table one day. I got curious. I think it's perfect. It is pretty, Remus agreed. But don't you think it might be tempting fate? Sirius scoffed. What? Like she won't be a wolf if we name her something else. Well, Remus said slowly. I mean, how much of that book did you read? I don't know. Don't you think she looks like a Selene? Remus considered his daughter. Objectively, she looked like a newborn baby. There wasn't much to see yet, just a pink and wrinkled face scrunched up beneath the brim of the fleece hat Hera had put on her. He knew from his research it would be a while before distinctive features developed. Still, he understood what Sirius meant, somehow. She was beautiful, and she had character. She would achieve something great one day, something to earn the grandeur of her name, Remus was certain. She does, Remus admitted. All right, Selene it is, then. Sirius stroked Selene's hand with his thumb, making a happy sound when the digit was encased by her tiny fingers. Selene Lupin. No middle name. Hmm. How about Hope? Remus was breathless for a moment. Still, are you sure? Why wouldn't I be? Well, she's your daughter, too. Don't you want? Sirius tensed. What? I should name her after my mother. The woman whose favorite pastime was torturing her children. No, that's not what I meant, Remus said quickly. It's just that Hope would make all three of her names, from my side, as it were. I just think you should be more, included. Sirius relaxed back against Remus's chest. Sorry. I shouldn't. Last thing I want to do is think about that shit now. It doesn't belong here. No, Remus said. He pulled Sirius tighter against his side. I just don't really have. I mean, your mum was always lovely to me. Sirius huffed a laugh, slightly bitter. Other people's mums were always lovely to me. What about you, Fema? Remus suggested. For all intents and purposes, she was your mother. Yeah, Sirius said quietly. He gently bobbed his thumb, testing Selene's grip. She held firm. I did think about that, but then I thought about Harry. You know, if he ever has a daughter, maybe he'd want the name. Before Lily. Well, I don't know. Maybe he'd have twins. Remus smiled. I think Harry would understand. And I think he'd be honored. He already knows you loved his grandmother very much. Plus, Celine is his sister, maybe not by blood, but in all the ways that matter. And if James was still here. Fucking hell, Mooney, Sirius said thickly. Shut up before I cry. If James were here, Remus pressed. He would be honored, too. He'd tell you to do it. You know he would. Sirius exhaled. Yeah. Can just hear him now. You bloody well better name that kid after my mum, Pats. She's earned it after putting up with you for so long. Exactly. Sirius's throat worked as he swallowed. Okay. Yeah. Celine Euphemia Lupin. Beautiful. Remus kissed the top of Sirius's head. I'm so proud of you, love. You did so well. Me? What about you? We made her together. Yes, but you did all the hard work. Hmm, well. I won't argue with that. Sirius rested his head on Remus's shoulder. You're more than welcome to balance it out, though. You know, take care of the dirty nappies while I sleep for two weeks straight. Whatever you need, Remus promised. You know I'll take care of you. Both of you. Sirius sighed wistfully. Then again, I'm not sure I'll be able to put her down. They were both quiet for a moment, gazing down at their daughter. Then Sirius sat upright suddenly. Oh, but, shit, you haven't even. I'm sorry, Mooney. Here. Remus had been so enamored watching Sirius with Selene, he hadn't realized how badly he wanted to hold her, too. She made a soft noise as Sirius carefully handed her over, then her eyes opened, big and bleary and brown. Darker than Remus's own eyes, but her irises were flecked with the same amber. The wisps of hair curled around her ears were dark too, though not quite as black as Sirius's. 
Remus imagined it would become a rich mahogany color as it grew. Oh, he breathed as Celine gazed up at him. Hello, sweetheart. Celine cooed. Sirius sniffled next to him. And there I go. Fuck. The door opened. Remus snapped to attention, instinctually defensive, but he relaxed when he saw it was only Hera. How are we feeling, honey? She asked as she came to the bedside. Like a hippogriff kicked me in the ass and head. Sirius replied, swiping roughly at his eyes with the back of his hand. Perfect. Hera checked a few of Sirius's vitals, then nodded to Selene. All right if I have a little look at her, too. At Remus's nod, Hera leant down to fuss with her. Selene grumbled under the attention, then her mouth opened, and the peace of the room was promptly shattered. Oh, I know, baby, I'm sorry. Hera soothed. Well, there's certainly nothing wrong with her lungs, or anything else, from what I can tell. A nice, straightforward birth. That's what we like to see. Wish they were all this easy. Easy, that's me, Sirius said, snickering when Remus nudged him. Can I let the little man in? Now. He's absolutely desperate. Oh shit, yeah. Sirius pushed himself upright, rearranging the nest of blankets and clothes to make sure he was fully covered up. Yeah, bring him in. Hera left the room reappearing moments later with Harry in tow. Despite the fact he had been waiting for hours and it was far past his bedtime, his little face was alive with anticipation. When he saw the bundle in Remus's arms, he made an excited noise and rushed towards the bed. Remus put a hand out to halt him. Steady on, Harry. Babies are fragile. You have to be careful, all right? All right. Harry agreed impatiently. Can I see? Climb on up. Sprog, Sirius invited. Harry hitched himself up onto the bed. Remus turned Celine towards Harry, who eagerly leant in to peer down at her. Celine's crying tapered off as she blinked up at the new face. Hey. Harry breathed. She's so small. This is Celine, Remus told him. Your little sister. Hi, Celine. Harry said, waving. I'm Harry. Celine stared up at him seemingly captivated. Sirius sniffled again. When will she talk? Harry asked loudly. When can we play together? Hush, Harry. Not for a little while, yet. You'll have to be patient and gentle with her until then, okay? Harry looked a little disappointed, but he nodded. Can I hold her? Remus considered. Lean against Padfoot. I'll put her on your lap. Sirius helped Harry arrange himself so he was propped up securely with a cushion on his legs. Then Remus lowered Celine onto it, instructing Harry on how to hold her and support her head. Harry grinned from ear to ear the whole time, chest puffing with pride when he got it right. I hate to interrupt such an adorable scene. Hera started, smiling at them all. But you need to get some rest, Sirius. You should start settling in for the night. Oh, Sirius said, dejected. Can't I just go home? We'd prefer that you didn't. It's procedure to keep you overnight, just to make sure there's no unexpected complications. But you just said we were both fine. I'm sure Hera knows what she's doing, love, Remus said gently. I'm not saying she doesn't. Sirius huffed. It's just, I don't like hospitals. They don't smell right. Not many people do, Hera acknowledged. I must admit even I'm not keen, and I work here. Actually, that's probably why. I like hospitals, Harry said brightly. I saw a man with a tree on his head, and they have gobstones in the waiting room. That's why I became a healer, Hera said laughing. Remus chuckled too, but Sirius remained quiet. Remus reassured him. Hey, it's okay. It's just one night. A few hours, really. And I'll be right here with you. What about this one? Sirius nodded towards Harry. Don't suppose you remember to Al Molly while I was busy screaming? Oh, Merlin. In all the panic of rushing to the hospital and the anxiety of Sirius's labor, Remus had completely forgotten to inform Molly they would soon need to impose upon her, and now it was the early hours of the morning. I better just take him now. I'll send a Patronus ahead. It's still not much warning, but it's better than nothing. Sirius frowned. Why do you have to go? 
I thought she offered to come and get him. That offer was contingent upon notice. Now we're waking her up in the middle of the night and just assuming she'll still take him. That's cheeky enough, without also demanding she come and pick him up, too. Remus sighed, frustrated with himself. The least I can do is go in person, so I can convey my contrition face to face. I wanna stay too. Harry protested, but he failed to stifle a yawn. Remus shook his head. You need a proper night's sleep after all this excitement. It was more diplomatic reasoning than telling a five-year-old his adopted parents needed a day without his boisterousness to settle the new baby into the house. Besides, we need someone to tell the Weasleys all about your new sister. It's a very important job. Harry perked up at that. Okay, I can do that. Good, say goodbye for now, then. Harry obediently waved at Celine again, despite the fact she had already fallen back to sleep. Remus carefully scooped her up from the pillow and kissed her forehead. He handed her to Sirius, who was looking at Remus with fretful eyes. Don't be long, he said. Remus cupped Sirius's face. I couldn't be long away from you. Back in a flash, I promise. Despite all his assurances, Remus still felt wrong the second he stood up. One step away from the bed and he was already desperate to return. Sirius was right. The hospital smelled awful, so sterile and cold. He hadn't noticed it so much when he was wrapped up in the nest of the bed, but now it was absolutely assaulting his nose. He must have been pulling a face, because Hera said, I know, I'm sorry. We do our best to keep the natal rooms neutral scented, but with everything that goes on here it's a bit of a losing battle. That's why I tell my staff to recommend their patients bring a lot of things from home. Guess we didn't bring enough. Sirius grumbled, wrapping one of Remus's jumpers around Celine's bundle. In fairness to us, your senses are in overdrive right now. Hera looked wryly at Remus. Yours, too. You're both going to be very on edge for the next couple of weeks. I know. Remus smiled sheepishly. Other than this mishap, I'm actually very well prepared, believe it or not. He had done a lot of research while Sirius was pregnant, so he wasn't surprised by the sensitivity and clinginess on either of their parts. In the coming days of adjustment to their new family structure, Sirius would need Remus to make him feel especially secure and safe, which Remus's own instincts would also demand. To that end, the house was already set for a good few days of peaceful isolation. The kitchen and nursery were stocked, the bathroom had everything Sirius needed to ease his aches and pains, and the wards were securely replenished. This room, nobody else will come in. Remus checked. No. Hera confirmed. Only the assigned healer is permitted. Unless there's some sort of dire emergency, like the hospital is on fire. Which, it has been known to happen. But I don't think anyone's checked in with flaming hiccups today, so we'll probably be fine. Still. Sirius said. Hurry up, Mooney. Hurry up, Mooney. Harry repeated, giggling. Remus tutted, ushering Harry down from the bed. He paused by the doorway, nodding gratefully when Hera took Harry's hand and led him out into the corridor. He felt an awful pang in his chest when he turned back to Sirius, the way he looked sitting alone in the bed with their daughter in his arms. I'll be right back, Remus stressed. In and out, I swear. Sirius gave him a slightly wobbly smile. I'll be fine. Just. Yeah, be quick. Remus dithered, trying to make himself leave. Every instinct he had was fighting it, but he couldn't see any other reasonable way to deal with this. I love you. Love you too. Now fuck off before I cry again. With a resolute breath, Remus finally managed to depart the room. He took a moment to breathe after the door shut behind him, inadvertently catching the eye of a man sat outside the room opposite. He was dressed in a formal suit that seemed out of place given where they were. The majority of people Remus had seen had been in some state of dishevelment, either because they were about to give birth or bear witness to it. Remus was sure he himself looked a fright. Sirius's labor had started in the sleepy evening and had lasted for eight hours. They had left the house in such a rush that Remus had been forced to transfigure his slippers into shoes. The man was reading the Daily Prophet which also struck Remus as odd. 
was his mate in the room behind him. He seemed far too calm for that to be the case. He held Remus's gaze for a moment, expression neutral, before his eyes returned to the paper. Remus frowned, but he didn't have time to waste, so he continued down the corridor. He walked briskly, but with every step that took him further away from Sirius his body seemed to grow heavier, screaming louder, wrong, wrong, wrong. By the time he reached the department lobby, he wanted to break something. Harold was waiting with Harry by the stairwell that led to the flu. Remus drew his wand, but then realized he wasn't sure he could cast a Patronus like this. Not one strong enough to reach the burrow, anyway. He tried his best to concentrate on the joy of meeting his daughter, but the image of Sirius sitting alone with her kept tainting it. Merlin, what was he doing? He couldn't do this. He had to go back. But he had a responsibility to Harry, too. Remus, do you want me to take him? Hem. Remus jumped. What? Take him where? To the burrow. Remus blinked in surprise. You know where that is. Hera smiled. Mrs. Weasley is rather well known to my department. You would do that. I mean, no, I can't ask you to. You're not asking. I'm offering. Hera interrupted smoothly. It's a simple favor. And it's more for my benefit than yours. Honestly, I can tell by your face you're about to explode, and I really don't want another repeat of that fundraiser on my hands. Remus was startled into a laugh. Yes, honestly, I feel rather foolish. Not only did I forget something so important, but I didn't expect, well, I knew I would feel this way, of course, but the intensity. He trailed off, embarrassed. Hera smiled kindly. Don't worry, it's all very normal, etc. Come on. Let me take him. Remus exhaled with relief. Are you sure? Absolutely. Hera playfully ruffled Harry's hair, who guffawed and swatted at her. It means I get to spend more time with this little reprobate. You see, you want me to send the Patronus, too. Please, Hera this is. Thank you so much. Hera waved a hand. Go on and get back to your mate. Remus crouched down to hug Harry goodbye while Hera cast the spell. I'll see you tomorrow then, Harry. I'll pick you up in the afternoon, okay? Be good for Hera. Tell Auntie Molly that I'm sorry for the inconvenience, and thank her for having you. Okay. Harry said. He would remember maybe half of that, Remus knew, but Hera would no doubt relay the pertinent information anyway. The second they disappeared into the stairwell, Remus rushed back down the corridor, an apology already on the tip of his tongue. As he approached the room, he heard Celine crying. The man reading the paper was gone. A strange dead rose abruptly inside him, and he almost sprinted the final few paces to the door. Inside, the scent of Sirius's fear hit him like a slap in the face. The suited man was standing with his arms folded at the foot of the bed. Sirius was pushed bolt upright against the headboard, hunched protectively over Celine. His face was red and wet and livid. Mooney he gasped. Get him out. Get him the fuck out of here. Remus's vision blurred for a second. Adrenaline surged up inside him, propelling him forwards, but the man thrust an ID in his face, and the familiar ministry symbol was enough to cut through his rage, halting him. R.R. Ah, ah. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Lupin. Jeffrey Bogart, Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, Beast Division. Remus's heart sank, but he grit his teeth. Why are you here? This is a private room. You have no right. On the contrary, I have every right. Bogart said primly. You are a werewolf, are you not? Yes, as I'm sure you're already well aware. That still doesn't explain or justify this intrusion. We haven't broken any laws. I'm registered, and I report to the ministry once a year, as required. Remus tried to keep his voice level. He was accustomed to dealing with ministry harassment, so he knew how precarious this situation was. If he truly lost his temper, it would only end badly for him. I believe it is justified, given the circumstances. Bogart glanced towards the bed, wrinkling his nose at Celine's wails. As I was just telling your mate, when working in the interest of public safety, there is... She's a fucking baby, you evil prick. Sirius snarled. The fuck do you think she's gonna do? 
Babies grow. Bogart said coolly. They become adults. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you, Mr. Lupin, how dangerous a fully grown adult werewolf can be. It's my job to protect innocent people from that danger. And how do you propose to do that, Mr. Bogart? Remus said, equally coolly. Well, we would like to take the child. No. Sirius cried, headboard banging against the wall. No, no, fucking no. You're not taking her. Get the fuck out. Just for the night of the full moon. Bogart finished. Just to observe. No harm will come to her, I assure you. We only wish to confirm whether she is afflicted with the curse. The suggestion combined with Sirius's cries made Remus tremble. For a dizzying, terrifying moment, he thought his control would break. He didn't know how he managed to resist rushing to Sirius's side, nor throwing Bogart through the window, but his voice was remarkably measured when he spoke. We are perfectly capable of confirming that for ourselves, thank you. Bogart gave him a withering look. And you can be trusted to relay that information, can you? Remus stepped slowly between the bed and Bogart. He wasn't trying to overly intimidate, though he was much taller than the other man, and he couldn't help but feel a spike of satisfaction seeing Bogart's confidence waver. But there wasn't a shred of possibility that Bogart would be leaving this room with his child, and so that was where he needed to stand. He took a deep breath, trying not to think about the consequences of what he would have to do should words not work. Let me see if I have this right. Your uncertainty that I would write a simple letter led you to sneak into a hospital, intrude upon a private space, and terrify a helpless newborn. You deliberately waited until I was out of the room, knowing my mate would be alone and vulnerable, and thus easier to intimidate into complying with an unlawful kidnapping. Correct. This is not unlawful. No, then would you care to cite the specific law? Because I am very familiar with the statutes that pertain to lycanthropy, and I don't recall any that sanction cradle robbery. Bogart scowled. You can't hide her forever. If she is a beast, you are required. I had no intentions of hiding her, Remus said flatly. If my daughter has inherited my condition, I promise you will be the first to know. God forbid I interfere with the ministry's noble efforts to protect the public from the terrible threat of toothless infants. Bogart stared at him resentfully. I will expect you to notify us at the earliest opportunity. Agreed. Now, please leave. Bogart looked once more at Sirius and Selene, lip curling in obvious disgust. He strolled briskly from the room, muttering something under his breath. The second the door shut behind him, Sirius broke down. Remus. He came in, he started saying. Remus rushed to him pulling him into a fierce embrace. Hush, it's all right, love. I'm here. It's over. He's gone. Oh God, Mooney. Sirius clutched at him with the arm not cradling Selene, like he was desperately trying to make sure Remus was real. I'm so glad you came back. Thank fucking God you came back. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't make him leave. I thought we were gonna lose her. Oh, my love. Remus's heart broke with guilt. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I should never have left you. Did you, Harry? Hera took him to Molly's, so I could come back. She could see I was having trouble. But I shouldn't have bloody left in the first place. Sirius shook his head against Remus's chest. It's not your fault. You couldn't have known. I saw him sitting out there. Remus confessed. I thought it was odd. But I didn't. I just ignored it. Why did I just ignore it? Idiot. You thought the room was safe. It was supposed to be fucking safe. How did he even get past the desk? Don't they have any security in this bloody hospital? He could have used his position to get in. Made the staff think they had no choice. Sirius swore. I bet it was that prick Malfoy who sent him. Revenge for that time you wiped the floor with him. Possibly, Remus acknowledged. But it's also entirely possible he had nothing to do with it. Bogart's department keeps tabs on registered werewolves. They will have known you were pregnant. They could have been watching the hospital anyway, just waiting for this day. I should have realized, I know better than anyone what the ministry is like. Remus cursed himself again. Stop. You were here when I needed you. That's all that matters. Sirius turned his attention back to Selene, making tight, soothing noises until she started to settle. You protected our daughter. You did what I couldn't. 
Love, no. You protected her beautifully. I didn't do shit. Sirius said flatly. I just yelled. If you hadn't come back. Remus pulled Sirius tightly against him, kissing into his hair. If I'm not to blame myself, then neither are you. You did everything you could in your current state. They both fell quiet, breathing tensely as the weight of what just happened settled over them. What do we do? Sirius asked, voice small and weak, unlike him. Remus frowned. They had already discussed this at length. Exactly what I told him. We wait for the moon, and if Selene has the condition, we inform them. That was always the plan, wasn't it? Neither of them liked the idea, but it was the only way their child would have a life with any sort of normality. For all Remus despised the ministry and their meddling, he knew the alternative was far worse. Living as an unregistered werewolf was tantamount to an early grave. I guess. Sirius turned his face into the curve of Remus's shoulder, inhaling deep and shaky. But what if they try again? They won't, but even if they do, it doesn't matter. Nobody is taking our child, Sirius. I swear to you. He believed it, too. Now that they were out of the situation, Remus could see the encounter for what it was, a vindictive reminder to Remus of his place in the world, rather than a serious attempt at kidnapping. If they had really wanted to take Selene, they wouldn't have sent a single weasel of a man who would allow himself to be talked out of it. Perhaps Sirius was correct, and it was just a petty revenge stunt engineered by Lucius Malfoy. Either way, Remus thought it unlikely they would hear the suggestion again, so long as he informed them of Selene's status as promised. Sirius sniffed, hunching further into Remus. I want to go home, Mooney. Remus nodded. The air was clearer with Bogart gone, but it was still all wrong. The space felt tainted now. Sirius had dismantled the nest of blankets and clothes with all his thrashing around, and Remus couldn't relax, couldn't stop his eyes from darting continuously back towards the door. There was no way they could spend the night here now, whatever Hera had said. Remus placed Selene in the crib beside the bed while he helped Sirius to his feet and into some easy, comfortable clothes. He quickly packed away their things, then bundled Selene up, carrying her in one arm, the other firmly around Sirius's waist as they eased their way down the corridor. The receptionist made some noise about them checking out before they were supposed to, eyeing Sirius warily, but Remus made it plain it was non-negotiable, and a few cutting words about St. Mungo's security finalized the matter. He made sure to leave a note for Hera, explaining what had happened and asking her to contact them at home. The flu was out of the question, but Remus was riled up enough, determined enough that he knew he could apparate them all without a problem. The relief when they materialized in their living room was instant, like sinking into a hot bath. He immediately started steering them all towards the bedroom. Come on, let's get you to bed. Celine needs feeding every few hours, but she's going to be drowsy for a couple of days, so you should rest too, while you can. And you can shower tomorrow, if you're up to it. I love that you know all this shit, Sirius muttered. At least one of us is on top of things. You knew it too, Remus reminded him. Sirius grunted. You'll feed her. Remus looked at him, surprised. Sirius had been so determined he would nurse exclusively before. I thought you wanted to. Sirius didn't reply for a moment. I just want to sleep. Of course, Remus said delicately. It's just, the longer you wait, you might not be able to later. I know that, Sirius said huffily. It'll be fine. Remus didn't argue. Sirius's despondency made sense. To say he had had a hard night would be an understatement. But some time resting in sheets that smelled like them, in the warmth and safety of their home, was just what he needed to start feeling better. Still, Remus was slightly unnerved when they reached the bedroom and Sirius immediately buried himself under the duvet without another word or glance back at Selene. Remus stood, looking at the shape of him under the covers, until Selene made an unhappy noise. I think she's hungry. Are you sure you don't want to? Later. Okay, I'll take care of it then. Leave you to sleep for now. Hmm. Remus dithered for a moment. He ached to join Sirius in the bed, hold him, reassure him, but it would have to wait. He took Selene down to the kitchen, 
opening the cupboard stocked with bottles and formula. Sirius had been resistant to the idea of having it, but Remus had insisted. It wasn't that he had doubted Sirius. Experience simply told him that it was best to be prepared for any eventuality. This definitely wasn't the way he thought he might be proved right, but he resolved not to worry yet. Still, Foresight didn't do much to ease the practical challenge of preparing everything one-handed, while Celine grew increasingly fussy and impatient. Remus almost dropped the bottle while trying to scoop the powder and read the label at the same time, which is when it occurred to him he probably should have brought the small bassinet down from the nursery, but it was too late to go back for it now. Overall, the process was unpleasant, leaving him feeling foolish and incompetent. But when he finally sat down at the table, and Celine immediately quieted as she began to feed, all negativity evaporated. Harry had been beyond the bottle-feeding stage when he came to them, so this was an entirely new experience. Remus found himself captivated, fascinated by his daughter. The miniature perfection of her, delicate eyelashes fluttering in contentment, tiny little fingers grasping at his hand where it held the bottle, making it seem comically large. He was relieved to see all that shouting and upset didn't seem to have affected her negatively. He could feel himself smiling registering that something inside him was shifting, clicking into place with a profound sort of finality. I'm a father. It wasn't that Remus hadn't felt anything like this before. Harry had been a revelation, and Remus truly did love him as his own. But there was no replacing James and Lily. He was reminded of them every time he looked at Harry, and that was the way it should be. It was a revelation of a different kind to see himself reflected instead in the little person in his arms. Himself and Sirius. Part of them both, made of them both. In the not-so-distant past, Remus never could have imagined a day would ever come when such a thought would fill him with pride, as opposed to guilt and dread. Subconsciously, he had assumed any child of his would grow up hating him, resenting him for their own existence the same way Remus had never stopped hating the man who bestowed the curse upon him when he was young. Though the future was never certain, Remus couldn't comprehend that happening now. There would simply be too much love in the way, too much determination to make sure Celine would never suffer as he did. If trepidation had any place at all, it was unease with himself, since he was remarkably unconcerned for the upcoming moon. A tiny part of him even whispered how it might not be the worst thing in the world to share. He didn't let that thought develop further. Celine finished her first bottle, burped obediently when Remus rubbed her back, then promptly fell back asleep. It was then that Remus realized how exhausted he himself was. The house was gloomy in that way that suggested sunrise wasn't far off. Yawning, he took Celine up to the nursery. It was pretty as a picture after his decorating, but she wouldn't sleep in the handsome wooden cot just yet. For the first few weeks, her bed would be a small crib at the foot of his and Sirius's bed. But they would spend a lot of time here regardless. They had learned their lesson with Harry. A baby required a surprisingly large amount of things. Far more than a single cupboard could contain. He shifted through the box of clothes, some new, some hand-me-downs of Harry until he found a sleep suit that looked about Celine's size. It was made of soft white fleece, patterned with tiny cows that were suspended mid-jump over smiling moons. Remus didn't recognize it, which meant Sirius must have acquired it at some point. Celine remained sleepy and pliant as Remus maneuvered her little limbs into the suit and closed it with the press studs. He returned to the bedroom, careful to enter quietly so as not to disturb Sirius and laid Celine gently in the crib. He got stuck looking at her, smiling, until Sirius shifted under the covers. Mooney, he mumbled. I'm here, Remus said. He stripped down to his underwear and slid into bed beside Sirius. He hesitated to get close, suddenly horribly unsure it would be welcome, but Sirius rolled over and spooned up against him, laying his head on Remus's chest with a sigh. Relieved, Remus put an arm around him and pulled them flush. He quickly noticed Sirius was alarmingly hot, burning through the hoodie and joggers he was still wearing, hair stuck to his neck and forehead. You're very warm, love. Don't you want to change? I'm fine. 
Are you sure? I can. I said I'm fine. Sirius repeated. It sounded like his teeth were gritted. Stop questioning everything I do. I wasn't aware that's what I was doing, Remus said quietly. I know you're upset right now. I'm just trying to help you through it. There was silence. Then Sirius said in a very small voice, Sorry. It's all right. Talk to me. Another silence. Remus could practically hear the wheels in Sirius's head turning, the tense beating of his heart. His postpartum scent was thick. It would have been comforting, intoxicating to Remus, if there wasn't also that sour undertone that had been clinging to him since they left the hospital. I just feel useless. Sirius muttered eventually. I nearly lost our daughter, like, an hour after meeting her. You are not useless. It's not your fault, Sirius. You were in a vulnerable position, and that man took advantage of you. I just think I'm gonna mess this up. Mess her up. Why do you think that? Sirius kind of shrugged. It's in my blood, isn't it? Remus sucked a breath. No, it isn't. You're not your parents. You've already proven that by breaking the cycle. I don't know. Maybe I didn't get away quick enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. You absolutely are, Remus said fiercely. I know you are, and before today, you knew it too. You've just had your confidence knocked by that ministry cretin. But the Sirius Black I know wouldn't let a horde of bigoted bureaucrats get the better of him. Sirius huffed a laugh, a reassuring sound. Don't you mean Sirius Lupin? Yes, Remus said, heart fluttering. And that's a name you chose, remember? Because you can choose. Blood doesn't bind you to some predetermined fate. He paused. And you can believe that, coming from me. Sirius raised his head, looking at Remus curiously. You're not worried about the wolf anymore. Of course I am. I will be as long as I live, to some degree. But, Remus frowned, trying to put it into words. You've, doing this, it's changed the way I think about it. I'm not so afraid anymore, because I can't afford to be. That's not the example I want to set for our daughter. I want her to believe she can handle anything life throws at her. Sirius's face crumbled. He dropped his forehead to Remus's chest with a harsh exhale. Remus felt tears on his skin. Fuck's sake. Bloody hormones. Remus laughed softly, stroking Sirius's sweat-damp hair back from his face. You really are warm, sweetheart. Will you let me put your hair up? Help cool you down. At Sirius's nod, Remus summoned an elastic tie from Sirius's bedside table, gently gathering his beautiful black locks into a ponytail. How about we lose the clothes, too? Sirius made a reluctant noise, face still hidden in Remus's chest. He confessed. I don't want you to see me. What? Why? I'm a mess. Gross. Remus snorted at the idea. You, gross. Impossible. I have fucking tits. Sirius said glumly. And my stomach still, ugh. I thought it would go back to normal after she was out. It will. It's just going to take a little while. Remus stroked Sirius's shoulder. Come on, this is silly. You just gave birth, Sirius. Of course you're not going to look ready for the Yule Ball right away. Your vanity gets the better of you, sometimes. Sirius raised his head again to scowl at Remus. I'm not vain. I'm just not used to being so. Gross. You're never gonna wanna shag me again, seeing me like this. Remus didn't point out that he had already seen him at the hospital. Please, you know a day will never come when I won't be ready to take you to bed at the slightest suggestion. Besides, you see the state of me after every moon, and you still want to shag me. I assume. Sirius scoffed, but in a decisive motion, he sat up to pull the hoodie off. Then he sat still, eyeing Remus critically as though daring him to make an expression or comment of disgust. But all Remus saw was the same unfathomably gorgeous man he'd been seeing for the past sixteen-some years. The differences to his body were a mark of what he had gone through to bring their child into the world. That couldn't be anything other than beautiful. Beautiful, Remus reiterated. Sirius flushed, folding his arms over himself. Yeah, whatever, Mooney. Come here. Sirius swallowed. I, ha, uh, need some time. Duh, Remus said, smiling wryly. As irresistible as you are, I'm not going to ravage you while you can barely walk. I just want to hold you. 
Sirius smiled too. He started to lower himself, but paused, frowning as he looked around at the bed. Do you want to make a nest? Remus guessed, gently encouraging. We could bring Celine in. Sirius's head snapped towards the crib. Oh, yeah. He bit his lip, looking suddenly contrite. Is she okay? Did she? She's absolutely fine, Remus reassured him. She had the whole bottle, no problem. Sirius nodded. Then he inhaled, seemed to steal himself. I'll feed her from now on. Remus sat up and kissed him. The moon was in three weeks, and he wasn't worried at all. Finite. Thanks for listening to this text-to-speech podfic composed by Burning Aurora.